It's only a little operation. Maybe a new man next week. In the UK, some three million major operations are carried out every year. We're going to give you something just to take the edge off your nerves. So you're on the other side. But some patients' procedures are so complex, only the best surgeons can perform them. Starting on the chest. There is a very fragile line between life and death, and I know this because I've seen it. Adam Brooks and Royal Papworth Hospitals in Cambridge are world renowned for their pioneering techniques to treat conditions that few others dare to take on. The surgeries we do now used to be the stuff of science fiction. But pushing the boundaries of modern medicine comes with great risk. In instant, things will go horribly wrong. And we're impressing the brother, he's arresting. The surgeons bear the ultimate responsibility. There's no room for self-doubt. You have to completely believe in what you're doing. Come on, guys, come to stitch, let's stitch. The currency that we deal in is the most valuable thing on the planet. It's human life. I hate to ask the question, but if this doesn't work, what would you like to do? It can feel a very lonely place. You're very much sticking your head above the parapet. This is what really happens behind the closed doors of their operating theatres. Excuse me, quiet, please. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If this escapes from us, we're in big trouble. He's testing everything up to the limit. It's a beast. When your back's against the wall, you just have to think, this is not going to beat me. Royal Papworth, Britain's leading heart and lung transplant centre. Follow the north and somebody will help you up there. OK, right. lovely, thank you. A hundred heart and lung transplants are performed here every year, more than anywhere else in the country. Quite elated that it's going ahead. The last chance to save these patients' lives. I'm very passionate about transplantation. I think it's fantastic that you can offer a procedure that will save and change someone's life forever within a few hours. Marius Berman is among a select group of surgeons in the UK with the skills to carry out particularly challenging transplants. Today, he's been called in to do one of the most difficult, the double lung transplant. A double lung transplant is a huge procedure. In instant, things will go horribly wrong. With donor organs in short supply, Marius must execute the procedure today perfectly. And do you know how they're getting on with the bronchoscopy? Oh, OK, great. His first port of call is with transplant coordinator Daniel White. Thanks, Donna. Cheers. Bye. Hello, transplant. Daniel speaking. Daniel is liaising with a hospital a hundred miles away, where a pair of donor lungs are being tested to check they're good enough for transplant. Thanks, mate. Hey. hey, so our recipient, he's just arrived at the hospital. Marius's patient is 52-year-old ex-plasterer, David, here with his sister Kay. He urgently needs a double lung transplant to save his life. But he knows there's a one in 10 chance he won't survive the operation today. How are you feeling? Anxious. All right. Okay. Okay, yeah, fine, thank you. I've been waiting for this call, but now it's here. It's all a bit overwhelming. Thank you very much, David. Very best Appreciate of luck. Good drive. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Dave. Nice Thanks for getting us here safely. Thank thank you. Cheers, Dave. Bye bye. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, then, I suppose I better get settled. David has a genetic disorder called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which destroys the air sacs in his lungs. So his lungs are failing. OK. Yeah? yeah. Mm. It'll be all right. Any time you move, you are completely out of breath. I used to say, as every year goes by, it's getting worse. But now I say it's, it's every day. Without surgery, David will die within a year. The condition has already claimed the life of his and Kay's older brother. 
Robert was on the transplant list around nine or ten years ago, but he was petrified of the operation. When he got the phone call, he was very, very anxious about it. And when we arrived at the hospital, he was so upset and he was sobbing and he was crying. And he said he couldn't go through with it. So he decided not. What to do? Right, then I'll do your robs now. Really all? We tried to convince him not to take himself off the transplant list, but he did. And now he's passed away. Now I'm determined to go through with it. What's your plan for the surgery? So this guy was seen uh, and discussed by the, the MDT. The double lung transplant that David needs is so demanding that Marius has called on fellow surgeon Pedro Caterino to lend a hand. Lung transplant, it's complex and it's high risk to the patient. So it's definitely good to have two experienced heads on the case and take the pressure off at key moments. I like operating with Marius. It's a bit like maybe a dance where both uh, members of the dance know the steps. How big are the donor lungs? So they were eight, uh, eight and a half. Eight and a half, so big lungs. Yeah, yeah. As soon as the donor lungs are cut from their blood supply, they will start to deteriorate. So Marius and Pedro will need to work fast to transplant them into David. Are you going to start with the right lung? Yeah, I think so. Pedro will start the operation with a small incision just under the nipple through which he'll remove David's diseased right lung. As soon as it's cut from the windpipe and blood supply, patient David will have to rely solely on his remaining left lung to oxygenate his body. Once Pedro connects the donor lung to David's blood vessels and airway, it can take over the job of supporting David's body while Marius removes and replaces the other lung. David has been waiting for this urgent transplant for four months. In another four months, he'll be too sick to have the operation. Hello. All right, it's Daddy. Yeah. I'm just letting you know I'm here. Okay. And um, I'm just waiting for the transplant coordinators to come yeah. round. All right. No one said yeah. no yet. He's got a son that's 14 years old. He would have preferred to be able to be more active with his children. He really wants a new lease of life. Just phone up and say, love you loads. Okay, I love you too. And I uh, will speak with you soon. Yeah, All OK. Right? All right. Catch you later, boy. Love you. I love you. Bye. Bye. Been waiting a long time for this. I need this transplant. Next door to Royal Papworth is Addenbrooke's Hospital, also world-renowned for its specialist procedures that have no room for error. Rod Lang is among the country's leading spinal cord surgeons. Today, he's performing one of the most dangerous operations in his field, where the smallest mistake will be catastrophic. As neurosurgeons, there is always a concern that any false move could result in permanent paralysis. And so that anxiety is ever present. But for me, it produces a further determination that whatever I do today has got to be the best that I can do and, and deliver. Rod's patient is 53-year-old Kevin, who's come to hospital with his wife, Jane. Rod has warned them that the operation today could leave Kevin severely paralysed. I said to my wife, if I end up paralysed from the neck down, she's carting me off to Switzerland, and that's that. Because I'm not going to have somebody else looking after me. She doesn't deserve that. It's frightening. We've got a 12-year-old daughter. 
He said a few things to me that I'm not too keen on um, about if it goes wrong, what he'd like to do, but it's not going to go wrong. Kevin has a cavernoma on his spinal cord, a tumour-like bundle of abnormal blood vessels about the size of a raspberry. Is this my bed? Yeah. If left untreated, it could rupture at any moment and kill him. Kevin's cavernoma sits in an extremely dangerous place near the top of his spinal cord. The cord carries signals from the brain to the rest of the body, controlling all movement and Kevin's breathing. So the cavernoma will need to be carefully removed millimeter by millimeter. If the cord is damaged, the signals can't travel down it. That would leave Kevin paralyzed from the neck down and unable to breathe without artificial support. Well, thanks for popping in this morning. I think this is going to be uh, a challenging case. I've only operated on seven of these. I was just looking through all my records in you know, 25 years of consultant practice. They are pretty uncommon. The procedure requires hours of painstaking microsurgery. So Rod will be joined by fellow neurosurgeon Richard Mannion. It's arguably one of the riskiest things that we do in neurosurgery. Dissecting a cavernoma at that level of the spinal cord and things don't always go well. The cord will be so thin that there's no margin for error, is there? Yes, and that's always for me a, a kind of worry. We have to be absolutely clear in our own minds that the risk of the treatment is significantly less than the risk of doing nothing. Here's the Danny. Kevin works as an HGV driver and only found out that he had the cavernoma two months ago. People were pointing out I was limping and I hadn't really took too much notice. A bit reluctant to go to the doctors, but in the end, bite the bullet, let's find out what's going on. And by the sounds of it, luckily I did. If only I could see into the future. It'll be right. It'll be fine. I think the hardest thing to wrap my head around was that he's got this thing in his neck and we didn't even know it was there. You know, how could how could this be happening when you didn't know it? Hi. Hi. Very high. I'm trying to be strong, I guess, for everybody. I will see you after the operation. No problem. Yes, have fun. Bye. Bye. I don't want him to know how worried I am. Just come home. That's all we need. One of the fascinating things about being a doctor is you form very strong bonds very quickly with people who you operate on. Hi, Kevin. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. How are you? I'm very well, thank good, you. Good, good. Hand steady. They're looking good, they're looking good. Yep. I have no doubt it's the right thing to do. Yep. As my wife said, if, if it wasn't the right thing to do, you'd be saying, we'll leave that there, it's all right. You know, you're the professional, not me. So I'll take your advice and um, we'll give it a go. Good. Ready? Let's go. I'm feeling very, very nervous now. But I don't try and let too many people know that I'm nervous. Morning. Ah, oh, my calming faces, you see. So, Kevin, can you just tell us what you're having done today? Splinter removed, I believe. <laughs> is there a marking on your site where we're operating? Yes, yes, there is, great. It's a lot of trust. Do you put the trust in their hands? After the surgery's done, as long as I can wiggle my fingers and my toes, I'll be a happy man. See you on the other side. Good. I'm going to take you really good care of you. Well done, Kevin. Hello. Where would you like to start? Uh, do I start ahead? Neuroclinical physiologist Rebecca Chiripanyanga plays a key role in theatre. 
Through sensors attached to Kevin's body, she will monitor how his spinal cord is working throughout the operation, giving Rod and Richard crucial warning if there's a problem. Kevin's surgery is, is very high risk. What we're trying to do is provide Rod and Richard with information that they need to protect Kevin's spinal cord. At regular intervals during the surgery, Rebecca will send an electrical signal into the motor cortex part of Kevin's brain, tracking it down the spinal cord and out to the nerves that terminate in his arm and leg muscles. If the spinal cord is working, his limbs will twitch. But if movement is reduced or stops, Rod and Richard will know their surgery may be threatening the cord. If Rebecca tells me that there is a problem, then I can react instantaneously to that. Stop the procedure, wait, give the motor pathways time to recover before they are irreversibly damaged. Before surgery starts, Rebecca needs some baseline readings. We're just going to run some motors. The patient's going to move. So how are they looking? Motors uh, are all present, upper and lower limbs, left and right. It's great to have Rebecca as part of the team. She is my early warning system. I trust her absolutely. OK, so we're, we're all set. Oh, we're going for it. First, Rod and Richard need to access the spinal cord. OK, so if I could have a bone nibbler, please. They start by removing parts of the vertebra in the back of Kevin's neck. OK, what do you reckon, Richard? Do you think that's... Uh, yeah, I think it looks pretty sufficient. good. Sufficient? Then cut through the protective membrane, covering the spinal cord. This is all the spinal fluid coming out now. Using sutures, they open up the incision to reveal the cavernoma. There it is. It doesn't look all that friendly. No, it doesn't. It looks ugly. The spinal cord is this uh, beautiful white structure normally. And cavernomas are these big, black, ugly beasts which just look threatening. It's quite scary, isn't it? It does look awesome. There's absolutely no way this thing wasn't going to cause any problem. When you see the cavernoma, you realise that this is not going to be easy. There is always the possibility of disaster in this type of surgery. And so much depends on the perfect execution of the operation. Just have an over there, isn't it? It's that way. I am thinking start here. Yep. Diamond knife, please. It is clear that this is going to be a very challenging day. Next door, at Royal Papworth, it's three hours since David arrived. I'm feeling quite emotional at the moment. <laughs> Getting more and more anxious now it's gone past two o'clock. He's waiting to hear if the donor lungs have passed testing and his double lung transplant can go ahead. Let's go. OK. Every year, nearly a fifth of lung transplants are cancelled at the last minute because the donor organs aren't suitable. So, this is Mr Berman, who's our surgeon. Hello, sir. How are you? How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you. The retrieval team is happy with the lungs and we're going ahead. Roughly in the next 10, 15 minutes, Tanya will take you down. Do you have any questions? No. Just glad to see you and glad that it's all going ahead. Yeah, I'm really happy. The face expression when the patient and the family hears we go ahead, it's fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Doctor. Thank you. Good luck, and I hope it all goes well. All right. Oh, well done. That's good. Mm -hmm. You're going down now anyway. All right. We're just relieved that it's coming now. 
You'd be right. It's what you wanted, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah. You'd be fine. Can you be a new man next week? He's very nervous and got lots of thoughts going through his head. And he's probably wondering if he's going to come through it. Hello. Right, Jamie, it's Daddy. Just letting you know um, the lungs are good and I'm being taken down now to surgery. Are you saying goodbye to your loved ones? Or are you going to be seeing them in a few days' time? I love you loads, son. And I, love you so much. I will see you soon. I love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. Love you. Good morning. Hopefully it all goes well and okay. you get a nice new set of lungs and you'll have a better life. Bye, Dave. Hello, so welcome to theatres. It was a big operation, as everybody knows. I just hope we'll wake up, that's all. Are you cool? I was just shaking yeah. because of everything. Yeah. That is normal. Hi, my name's Dr. Bert. I'm one of the anaesthetic consultants. Hi. We're going to give you something very soon just to take something. the edge off your nerves. A glass of wine or a, okay. or a pint of beer. What would your choice be? Jack Donald's and Coke. Fair dues. There's a large, large double of that just going in now. <laughs> As anaesthetist, Christy Burt puts David to sleep. Hello, Transplant Daniel speaking. Transplant coordinator Daniel receives word that the donor lungs have been cut from the donor's blood supply and are ready to start their two-hour journey to Royal Papworth. Hi there. Um, you've got a vehicle for me stood by. Just let you know that they've cross-clamped, so if your driver could make their way to theatre, and then I'll authorise blue light. Cheers, bye-bye. From the moment the lungs stop having a blood supply in the donor, there's a sudden urgency to the whole procedure. Guys, are you happy for me to start? Yes, thank you. The right lung is deflated. Every minute that the lung is without a blood supply, it's being slightly damaged. So now every minute counts. The donor lungs will only be good for transplant for another eight hours. Pedro starts the operation while they're en route, so he's ready to stitch the first one in as soon as it arrives. Let's have a knife, please. So that's surgery start. He will detach David's right lung at four points, starting with the major blood vessels which connect it to his heart the two pulmonary veins and the pulmonary artery. Next, he will sever the bronchus where the lung joins the airway. The diseased lung can then be removed and the donor lung inserted and attached at the same points. Right, Jesus. It's a very diseased lung. I'm struggling to get around this main vein. Pedro's job is particularly challenging because he chooses to work through an unusually small incision, a technique he's introduced at Papworth. Ideally, I want to put my hand in. Yeah. Many leading surgeons worldwide do large incision across half of the patient, which is called the clamshell incision. So it's a very friendly incision for the surgeon but the patient themselves are in pain, struggling to mobilize after the surgery. That was a process that was led by, by Pedro to do smaller and smaller incision. Look, look how small it is. It's beautiful. Oh, it's for the patient, yeah, not for yeah. us. So there I can just about see the top edge of the pulmonary artery. Pedro's small incision makes cutting the pulmonary artery one of the body's largest blood vessels even more difficult. Okay, let's have a peanut, please. It's uh, like they're having a long finger. We can't see what's at the back of the blood vessel, so really we're using an instrument to carefully feel behind the blood vessel. I'm scared to put this around. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It feels like the pressure's quite high in the artery as well. The artery carries two and a half litres of blood from the heart every minute. As Pedro prepares to cut and staple it, there's no room for error. 
You can't nick an artery or a vein. In one minute, you will fill the chest with blood, and that will be half the circulating blood volume, and the patient would almost certainly die. I think that will probably be enough, don't you mind? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you have a straight angle to... I'm firing the stapler. There we go. And there we are, we're through. There's a sense of relief when I know that that pulmonary artery is safe. I'm delighted with that. And now the lung is only attached to the body by um, the windpipe. Pedro is ready to remove David's lung. It's nearly there. But the donor lungs haven't yet arrived. I think we're ready to take the lung out. So gradually winkle it out. That's very, very diseased. Very diseased lung. There we go. See that enormous lung came out of that space? Quite surprising, isn't it? Yeah. Once the lung is out, it's irreversible process. And you are committed. You already started. The train left. Man, where are my lungs? Oh. The longer the lungs are outside the human body, you potentially risk that the lungs will not be as effective and essentially the lung will die. Sorry, I was expecting you to come to the ambulance entrance. Oh, sorry, <laughs> would you mind just asking Daniel? OK, I would. Great. What is possible car? What is possible car? Lungs are here. Thank you very much. The donor lungs arrive packed in ice and fully inflated to maintain their shape. They're nice looking lungs. There's a sense of wonder of seeing the inflated lung. These lungs will be probably seven liters with all the air in them. And you know, that is an amazing sight. Okay, scissors please. Okay. Marius and Pedro split the right lung from the left and deflate it like a balloon, so it will be easier to insert through the small incision. Nicely collapsed, nice and elastic. This is a beautiful, normal lung. You can see that lovely, healthy tissue of the windpipe. They connect long sutures between the donor and David's windpipe to guide the lung into position. Here we go. I'm just going to plop this in, little by little. I'm just hoping that the lung sort of squirms in through the space. We've lined up the two windpipes very nicely, and it's just a question of sewing these two together. You are matching tissues from two different individuals. Usually, they are not the same size. If they are not matched, you will have either an air leak or a bleeding or blood leak. Both of them are catastrophic. Tell me if I'm doing anything wrong, Maris. Uh -huh. You have my quality assurance. You could imagine if you were tailoring a suit, you wouldn't want creases in the shoulders or the, around the waist, and I'm thinking the same thing. OK, next thing I need is scissors, and then I need two small duvals. If you pull that suture tight, you would purse string the join, and that's going to narrow the passage of air when David breathes in and out. Can anybody move? Bringing those two structures that are different sizes together without causing any creases is an, is an art. OK, that's cool. I'm happy with that. But even a perfect connection between the donor lung and David's body is no guarantee the transplant will be a success. The best thing is that at the end of having done the technical procedure, 
the donor lung actually works. For whatever reason, around 10% of lungs don't initially transfer that oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's my biggest worry. It's the unpredictable element of lung transplantation. Unlike David, up to a third of Royal Papworth's transplant patients never get the donor organ they need. Scientists are constantly looking for ways to avoid the reliance on transplants. One team at Cambridge University, working just metres from the hospital, are leading international efforts to develop a technique to repair organs rather than replace them. Transplants are great treatment, but people, unfortunately, end up dying on the transplant list while they're waiting for one. So this would be an alternative treatment that can replace the need for transplantation. Dr. Sinner's team are working on a way to save patients from needing a heart transplant at all. They're using stem cells to grow patches of real heart tissue in the lab. The plan is to graft it onto a patient's failing heart to repair it. We know that embryonic stem cells can form any tissue in the body, given the right signals. And we're actually giving them cocktails of growth factors to try and push our stem cells to make heart muscle. We generate these cells uh, in little dishes. They take weeks to develop. We have to feed them every day. We really have to baby these cells. I mean, if you ignore them for a day or two, the cells will die. I mean, they need constant attention. A mix of proteins and hormones are used to turn stem cells into heart cells and also support cells called epicardium. It's a pioneering combination. These two types of cells work together to actually beat. The first time I saw heart cells beating down a microscope, I almost fell over because it was such a shock. It really is a, almost a sort of a Frankenstein moment. Dr. Sinner's team have now found a way to turn these beating heart cells into living heart muscle that moves and beats just like the muscle in our hearts. They use freeze-dried collagen to make a scaffold where the heart cells can grow and multiply. Within two weeks, a patch of functional heart tissue has formed. We see these beating patches. I mean, they look like a piece of muscle that's just contracting away. I never cease to be amazed by the fact that it actually happens. The team hope their patches will be ready for the first patient trials in three to four years. And that one day scientists will be able to grow tissue to repair even more complex organs, like lungs. We are looking at heart patches, but whether it's bone, whether it's liver, whether it's gut, and the potential of regenerative medicine to come up with new ways to repair organs is, is, is almost limitless. And, and I think this will revolutionize the lives and outcomes of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of patients. In Addenbrooke's hospital, surgeries are now underway in all 35 theatres. In Neurotheatre 22, Rod and Richard's entire focus is on carefully removing Kevin's cavernoma from a two centimetre stretch at the top of his spinal cord. One more cord there. That's extra, thanks. Here, the tiniest slip of the knife into the cord could permanently paralyze Kevin. Let me just open that tiny bit there. The abnormality is stuck to the tissue around it. So using a pair of micro scissors, you literally have to unpick little attachments. But in some parts, the cavernoma and the spinal cord are very intimately attached. Don't get too close to it. Still it wasn't in places. You're thinking, am I on the right side here? Have I got, am I preserving spinal cord and separating the tumor from it? Or has my plane of dissection wandered into the spinal cord itself and am I now causing damage? You are working on a knife edge. Oh, 
I'm trying not to frighten myself. This thing in his neck could change his life completely. We've got a daughter. I don't want her to know quite how serious it could be, but it's very scary. <sighs> yeah, do a motor, please. OK. At regular intervals, Rod and Richard pause to let Rebecca check they haven't caused any damage, and the signals are still running down Kevin's spinal cord. So, running now? I have to say that it is always with some trepidation that I await the results. What I'm hoping for is Rebecca to tell me there's been no change. There's a minute or so while you're scanning through those responses and making sure they're, they're the same as they were at the beginning of the surgery, and that can be a little bit tense. You're always thinking about how this is going to affect the patient afterwards. How is their life going to be following this surgery? Rich is doing his Pilates. I like to distract myself waiting. I suppose it's like waiting for any result, isn't it, when the result is very important to you? You do Pilates, do you? No, I do some, uh, like, exercise in the gym. I've got a gym at home. But equally, I'd rather know what's going on. OK, all present. Stable? Yeah, they're all present, they're all robust, they all look good. Fantastic, thank you. When the spinal cord monitoring tells you that all is stable, that gives you the reassurance to push on. It'd be nice if we could debulk it, wouldn't it? We could do a little bit. Reducing the size of the cavernoma could make it easier to remove. So Rod and Richard try using ultrasonic vibrations to break it down from the centre. Can we put the um, sonopet up to 60? This does risk bleeding, which potentially could result in damage to the spinal cord. Operations like this require a continuous process of decision-making, weighing up pros and cons. It's not really bleeding at all, is it? Which is good news. Having fragmented the cavernoma, Rod and Richard can now cut away sections a fraction at a time. And that suddenly looks better already, doesn't it? It always amazes me that the abnormality that under the microscope seems enormous. It's filling your whole world. But if you look at it round the corner, it's tiny. Oh, yeah, let's expose that bit nicely. After two and a half hours of painstaking microsurgery, Rod and Richard are only halfway through the job of removing Kevin's cavernoma. However straightforward the procedure might feel like it's going, you can't drop your guard. I'll just get it. Don't want that to bury itself in the cord. Because danger lurks around the next corner. Until the cavernoma is out completely, you can't relax. Royal Papworth in Theatre 4. It's nearly there. Pedro has almost finished connecting the first donor lung to David's blood and air supply. A couple of minutes from reperfusing. To get the new lung working, they will let it fill with blood, then oxygen. David will have to rely on this new lung entirely while his other lung is removed. So if it doesn't function, his chances of survival are slim. This is a big moment. It's a critical moment. The lung went through a lot. It was retrieved, packed in ice, transplanted. And now we want the lung to support the whole ventilation of a patient, which is a big ask. OK, let's see. Yeah. I'm going to reperfuse. You're happy with everything? Yes, thank you. He's nice and stable. Anaesthetist Christie needs to keep a close eye on David's vital signs. Because as blood is rerouted into his new lung, his blood pressure will drop, putting his entire circulatory system 
under huge stress. Now I'm going to take the PA clamp off, slowly. And we're hopefully filling. Patients have been known to go into cardiac arrest at this moment. It, it's the most anxious part of the operation, is that reperfusion. Before David got really ill, he was very active, very sociable, loved going out, going to the pub. You think in both sides of the coin, he could be fully fit and repaired and have a new chapter of life, but there are sides of the surgery that don't always go well. Just not knowing if you're going to see him again. <laughs> just got a dip in blood pressure, just giving some squeeze. There's not yeah. much blood coming out. No, there's not much. Coming back up again. That's fully reperfused. Marvellous. You can ventilate a little bit of this lung now. Now the crucial test of whether the new lung can do the job of breathing for David. Just be gentle. Gentle ventilation's just going in now. Look at that beautiful pink lung yeah. coming up, isn't it? Does it look as though it's nicely expanding? Yeah, the lungs look great. They're such a good sight. The lungs ventilate beautifully. And I see that the lung is nice and pink, and I'm happy. That was relatively painless. Do you like that? Are you happy for me to do that, sir? Yeah, yeah. Okay. After four and a half hours of intense concentration for Pedro, Marius takes the helm. Can you yeah. rotate the table towards me? No, please. Before removing David's left lung, he must decide how big to make his incision. Yeah, I was just thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't do a clamshell now, man. No, 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 no. There is a little bit of competition uh, between us. We'd like to see who can make the smallest incision and still do the surgery. Knife, please. Starting. This is always a point of, of debate between Pedro and myself. He does his incisions Sometimes too small, even for me. It's quite big. Yeah. I'm planning to open a bit more. Sometimes I do very small incisions, and sometimes I do slightly bigger than Pedro's, and um, I do face a little bit of uh, music about that. The massive hole you could put your head in there. Scissors, please. With David totally reliant on his new right lung, Marius cuts the major blood vessels attached to the diseased left lung. So the PA is cut and two pulmonary veins are cut. Good. Happy? Yeah. He just needs to detach the bronchus to remove the lung from David's body. So guys, I've just lost ventilation on the right. Is that you? Is that you guys? No. David's new right lung has suddenly stopped working. It's extremely dangerous if the anaesthetist can't ventilate the right lung. We're completely dependent on the right lung because the left lung is almost out. Can you just pass me the bronchoscope? Christy uses a surgical camera to check whether David's breathing tube has dislodged. Seems okay. The lung isn't moving up and down. I've got extremely high pressures on the right and I can't ventilate. It's always there in the back of your mind what potentially can go wrong. You don't have a lot of time to debate option. With neither lung functioning, David's body is being starved of oxygen. He will die in minutes. It's life-threatening, and really we have around four minutes to correct that problem. 
Maybe secretions or something. No, well, I've just had a look down and it looked pretty clear. Can you just switch the suction on for me? Getting some bloody secretions up. Which is a good sign. Yep. Looking a bit better. It feels a bit better to ventilate. It's, it's moving up and down. Good. We have ventilation back. I'm not quite sure why that happened, but after a bit of suction, it seems better again. So, yeah, I'm happy again. Yep, it's definitely the sort of excitement we can do without. With David stable again, Marius can finish removing the left lung. Left lung is coming out. Also a lot of disease. Left lung out. OK. He must get the donor lung implanted in the next 90 minutes before it becomes too damaged to work properly. OK, lung is out. Thank you. You have this clock in your mind. You know that the second lung has been on the ice for an additional two hours and you want to get going. You try to do the transplant as fast as possible, but in the same time, as safe as possible. A bit less, sir. Please. You need to be absolutely sure that every single stitch that you take, it's exactly the stitch that you want. You cannot compromise. No, don't pull. Okay. Man. Sorry, 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 sorry. Careful, it's a bit long, so careful now. I will cry if I need to start it again. You have to force yourself not to rush. If you get it wrong and you need to go back, you're actually going to lose more ground. My energy levels are flagging. I'm not as strong as Mr. Berman. Marius is like a diesel engine. He can go on and on and on despite any adversity. Oh, fuck. In the middle there, I think the damn thing has slipped. And the ability to focus, even if one is tired, is key to, to doing this sort of surgery. Another needle holder, please. Keeps opening. Looking OK, no? Yeah, it's a bit well matched. The left lung is finally attached to both blood and air supply. So we're reperfusing the, the left lung. Yeah, that pressure's coming up. That's great. Christy, do you mind giving some blows on this? Yeah, sure. Does the lung look like it's yeah, inflating? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks good. Lovely jubbly. When you see this beautiful lung tissues coming up like a balloon, you know you've done good today. When it goes up, it, it, it's essentially life. Have you got a ruler? So we are checking out the land. 10 centimeters. 12, 13. No, no, no. Hmm. 13 centimeters. So, 30 and 30 and flat. 16 hours after he arrived in hospital, David is leaving theater with a new and fully functioning set of lungs. What's two and what's four? In Adam Brooks, in Neurotheatre 22, Rod and Richard have spent three hours operating on a tiny section of Kevin's spinal cord. That doesn't look like mass, and then that does. But they are still trying to remove the last parts of the cavernoma that are stubbornly stuck to it. And that's definitely normal cords are. It's gonna oh, come across there anyway. Yeah. It's got on the tumor so, side of my hook. Yeah. 
every step of the procedure carries a risk of causing permanent damage to the spinal cord. We could do 99% of this procedure well and 1% badly, and that could ruin Kevin's life. Yeah, that's cool, isn't it? Can we run a motor? Not yet, not yet. Once this is free here, we're not far off, I don't think. Ooh, what a motor before. OK, Rebecca. You want a motor? Yeah. Running. Stimulating now. I don't think the patient's moving. Let me do a... We're just going to increase the stimulation on the right side and parts of the right leg. They're much, much reduced. That's where we are, isn't it? So that's a step change, is it, from the last time you did it? Yeah. You never want to go into an operation and the patient come out worse than they were when they went in. That's an incredibly uncomfortable feeling. The lack of movement suggests damage to the spinal cord and paralysis on Kevin's right side. Bear with me just a few minutes. There is only one thing I can do, which is to stop, take a step back, wash with saline, and then just wait. In some really intense surgeries, the pressure of having to provide the right information immediately does weigh heavily sometimes. There's only a tiny bit of it left stuck in, but it's stuck in that right area. Yeah. I, mean, I did do a case a few years ago where we did everything we thought possible to preserve the cord. Yeah. So never moved again. One of the sad things about being a surgeon is that you don't remember the successes. Unfortunately, what you remember are the patients who you have let down in some way, and those people stick in your mind. What do you think? Rebecca increases the stimulation to try and prompt a response. That's better, that's better. When we use that high stimulation on the right side, it has got the responses back. So it's improved? Um, yeah. And if you go back to the previous stimulation, are you getting anything? Very, very small. It's not clear enough, and it becomes quite difficult for us to interpret. It you know? always means something. You can't always put it together, but it always means something. The response means no catastrophic injury has occurred but it's possible some movement may have been lost. Rod and Richard will have to wait until Kevin wakes to find out. OK. OK, first of all, please. Their priority now is to finish the operation. That's the edge of it there. Yeah. I'm going to cut through there. Why don't you take it out? After nearly four hours of meticulous surgery, the last of the cavernoma is finally out. Thank you. At the end of the operation, I feel drained. In fact, this is something that I think I've become more aware of. It's not, it's not a physical thing I'm describing, it's, it's more emotional. OK, on three, one, two and three. You've given so much to achieving the outcome. But the proof of the pudding is in seeing Kevin in the recovery room. I'm uncertain about how he'll be. Hello, Kevin. How are you doing? Open your eyes for me. Can you give me a little squeeze here? Can you feel me touching your right hand? As Kevin wakes up, he has a very significant weakness 
of the right side of his body. But where there is movement, there is always hope for recovery, and that recovery can sometimes be astonishing. Can you move that right leg? Kevin, wiggle this leg for me. A little bit weak on this side, but I think that'll get back to normal. It's 12 hours since David's transplant. Oh, there it is. Oh, my goodness. Look at you. Hello. Oh, wow. He is already off ventilation support and experiencing life with new lungs. Oh, oh. wow. You're amazing. Look at you. I can't believe you're sitting up already. I can breathe. <laughs> I can breathe. It's really a fantastic sign that David is out of bed so quickly, breathing on his own. I'm delighted, really delighted. I took my first breath. Oh. <laughs> Felt different. And it was, oh, it was just, yeah, straight away. Oh, that's just straight away. Somebody like David, who has got through the surgery, is relatively young and has had a good early result, I firmly expect him to have a good long period with an excellent quality of life. I feel a new man. <laughs> Hi, darling. Hello, you are. It's Dad, yeah. I shall be leaving hospital in about an hour. With transplantation, you see an immediate effect. So you take patients who are really at the end of their life and you replace that failing organ and they are transformed by it. This is why transplantation itself, uh, for me, that, that's, that's a beautiful thing and I'm so happy that I'm able to do that. After three months of intensive physiotherapy, Kevin has recovered most of the movement he had before the operation. What I hope that we've given him is a future, a future that he doesn't have to worry about the risk of this cavernoma wrecking his life at any point. The body is the most amazing thing really in existence. If you think of the complexity, how we work, how many things can go wrong with us. It is the intricacy and how we repair ourselves that most surgeons would agree we're all, I think, in awe of. Next time. Clamp is on. Heart-stopping surgery. That's killed it. Certainly the first time you see a patient's heart stop, it's quite extraordinary. So if this escapes from us, we're in big trouble. And a notoriously dangerous procedure. We inflict what amounts to a fatal injury. And then we put everything back together again so that it ends up not being fatal most of the time.